I made a mistake. Um, I made a mistake by taking uh, too ambitious a subject to try to do in in the uh, given time, and I know I've done that before. Um, but I feel like it's kind of there's a benefit to do it all at once, because in this area of of understanding Torah, what Torah really is, and how it all works, there's so many misconceptions, and so many people ha- think different things, and it's not so clear because we've heard a lot of things and we've surmised a few of our own. It's very hard. Uh, for us to have clarity in this very important subject. Remember, the Torah is uh, obviously the most important uh, a book, uh, the written Torah, that is uh, probably in history. We can make that argument. Uh, it's the most popular book in history. Uh, it's a foundational book for for modern society. Uh, and, of course, as Jews, it's you know we believe it came from God. It's divine. Uh, and now uh, the oral Torah, that, that word, I think, um, uh, engenders... Um, different ideas from every one of us because well, what does that mean? The oral Torah, where is it? Where is it from? There's a lot of, a lot of very foundational questions we have to ask uh, about that. Um, and, you know, people, everyone says, well, the rabbis made it up or the rabbis have these sinister plans and they want to make our lives miserable and they commit this all oral Torah. And it's all, you know, a lot of people think that. Um, now, the goal of today's discussion is, A, to demonstrate what the Torah is and what, like, traditionally, we like, how it's, how, how it, um, uh, how it's understood, how it has been understood traditionally, uh, and not only that, to explain how it's, there's no other way that's possible. It means the, the goal, hopefully, is that as we emerge from the class today, it becomes clear that not only is the oral Torah, uh, doesn't make sense, but it's the only way to do it, and, and what it actually is, you know, you know, and just to, to understand how it fits in. Uh, and of course, it's a very important to start a subject for us, because uh, as Jews, we know we, we believe in, in a grand universal vision, you know, the idea of tikkun olam. And that's the idea where, as Jews, we are tasked with the responsibility to fix the world, which is, if we could think of a, we can't think of any bigger possible stage uh, or bigger, bigger possible mission than the entire world, um, uh, you know, the entire world. Uh, now, how do we do that? You know, what possibly could give us guidance in this grand universal mission that we have, and that's the Torah. So it's important for us to understand the document and its role and uh, how it all works, because essentially the fate of humanity and the world at large rests upon that. So I want to start with some common questions, you know, and I think the good question is to say, what's Torah? Well, what is Torah? Uh, Another way to phrase this question is we have a verse in Deuteronomy, Torah tziva lanu Moshe, morashat hiilat yakrov, this is all at the end of Deuteronomy. Torah was instructed to us by Moshe. It is the heritage of the congregation of Jacob. This is the heritage of the Jewish people. What is Torah? Well, what does this mean? It's teaching. Huh? Teaching, right? Yeah, so, so it means teaching. It, 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 it means teaching. And, uh, but it can mean a lot of different things. So we have a, a, a very foundational, very important Talmud in the book of Brachos. And it says as follows. And it quotes a verse in Exodus where Moshe is about to go up to the Mount Sinai, and God tells him, okay, what's going to happen at Mount Sinai? What am I going to give you at Mount Sinai? Uh, and Hashem said to Moses, to Moses, ascend to the mountain to me, and I shall give you the tablets of stone, and the Torah, and the commandment, mm-hmm. which I have written to teach them. Right? Five things. What are these five things that it's referring to? Tablets refer to the Ten Commandments. Torah refers to Scripture. Commandment refers to Mishnah, which I have written, refers to prophets and writings, to teach them, refers to Talmud. Concludes the Talmud, the verse thus teaches that all of them were given to Moses at Sinai. So, uh, to make the claim that at least traditionally the the outlook has been that the, the Talmud came much, much, much later, uh, or the Mishnah was uh, invented in the second century of the Common Era, many, many centuries after Moses and after Sinai, uh, according to the traditional Jewish approach, what it makes here abundantly clear, there's no really wiggle room, is that Sinai was not just about a written document, and we'll find out in a second that it was almost not at all about a written document, that came later, but it was about the Torah at large. Well, what's the Torah? It's the Ten Commandments. You know, there's the written Torah. There's the writings of the prophets, the lessons that are taught in the writings of the prophets, the whole Bible at large, the mission of the laws and the, and, and the Talmud with the understanding of the laws. All that was part of the Sinai experience. 
So traditionally, we're saying that Sinai was about Torah. Well, what's Torah? Torah is all of those five things that we're enumerating. And once again, I want, I want everyone to maintain their skepticism because we'll see how this, this all works out, hopefully. Yeah, the prophets all existed after all that. That's true. So how could that have been? Yeah, so it means the lessons of the prophets. It was all foreshadowed, I guess. Yeah, I remember. The, I mean, the question, the question is, yeah, well, if there's prophecy, then, right, if Moses is the prophet, then the fact that things happen in the future he knows about, well, that's the definition of a prophet, right? Um, but I, I think the simplest way of understanding without having to come to that is that, oh, the prophets give us lessons, right? If you look at the books of prophets, we find a lot of lessons that are relevant to us. Well, did Moses know that or did they invent that? No, Moses knew that as well. You know, they were the ones who developed those ideas, who popularized those ideas. Those, those, they became the ones who became associated with those ideas. Remember, um, the very first Mishnah, the very first statement of the chapters of the fathers, which is the book of Judaism that deals with ex- ethics, it starts off with the, uh, essentially the, um, uh, with Sinai, and then Sinai to Moses, and it kind of the, uh, the uh, transmission of the Torah process from Moses to Joshua, Joshua to the elders, elders to the prophets, prophets to the men of the great assembly. And it's kind of uh, doing the math from the times of Moses all the way down to Ezra and, and then to the, uh, then to the uh, Tanaim, to the, uh, uh, to the authors of the Mishnah. Uh, and I think the lesson, or well, at least one of the lessons of that is that even the ethics that we have that uh, Rabbi Drew the Prince teaches us a lesson in ethics. Well, where, where did he get that from? Did he make it up on his own? No, even that came from Sinai. And I think that would be the understanding of prophets and writings. Uh, but for our discussion, what's clear is that according to this Talmud, right, it's not, it's associating the Talmud and the Mishnah, the laws and the understandings of the laws, all the way back to Sinai and Moses. And we'll see that this is uh, not the only place that that's, uh, that's mentioned. Well, the are Ten Commandments. That's what it says. I understand. Where are they? Oh, where are they? They're in the holy ark. Yes, so. The question is, where's the holy ark? Yes, so. We need to ask Harrison Ford. Yeah, that's right. He found it. Where's the best thought process? Yes, so the Talmud tells us that there, uh, that it's likely that it was archived by... Uh, either the king or the high priest at the end of the first temple era when they saw that the temple was going to be captured and they were concerned that the holy vessels of the temple would be pillaged uh, they hid him somewhere I would bet it's in some cave in Israel or it's buried someplace in Israel, something like that So you definitely think they are in Israel? I would I would I would make that if I had to if I had to if I had to bet, but I, I'm not an expert at this. Um, the it's, templars were looking for that. Huh? The templars were looking for it. Oh yeah, I'm sure a lot of people are very interested in finding that. Uh, we have found a lot of stuff. We haven't found any of the vessels. You know, the question is, well, what about the menorah? Remember, in the second the second uh, uh, temple, we have a lot of vessels, but we don't have them all. We don't have the ark in the second temple. So, if you want to find the menorah, menorah should be closer and easier for us to find. Because that existed in the second temple as well, as opposed to the ark, which was only in the first temple. Did you see the other day they found um, a seal from uh, King Hezekiah in Israel? They find tons of stuff. It's, it's amazing how much stuff they find. And then you have people who still claim that, well, the Jews just tried here 20 years ago. You know, <laughs> Things in Hebrew and all the, everything that we're describing, right? Okay, so now... Like you said we're not, last week, we're not real good at propaganda. Yeah, we're terrible. You know, you know, we are terrible at propaganda. You know, <laughs> this is blue. This table is blue. I don't care what you see. That's what it is. And yeah, because, it yeah. I also think that people are more likely to hear, to, to believe what they want to believe. Yeah. So if people have a slant that, you know, they're, you know, they're predisposed towards, then and then someone comes with a claim and they don't really want to investigate it. It's not like people are all truth seekers in the world. Um, now, what's Moses' role? So this is kind of a... I don't know if it's a misconception. Um, I am working on a uh, on a book. I think probably the most heretical book of all time. Um, I can't um, wait to read it. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, and it's called "Who Wrote the Bible?" It's actually the first class that I ever gave in this room. 
I was uh, uh, someone uh, brought that up. Isn't there another book with that same name? Well, th this is the book, which is essentially the book um, that gives like a layman's guide to the documentary hypothesis. Does the end or the dispute differ? Oh no, it doesn't end the dispute. No, more questions on this. no but it, it's it's essentially the layman's guide to the theory that there's multiple human authors of the Torah, and then there's one guy who comes and puts it all together. Um, and he begins his book by saying, well, traditionally, the Jews have always said that Moses is the author of the Torah. Now, I don't know if, how many of you have written books. Any, 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 any uh, authors here? Oh, there you go. So you have a book. So um, one of the most frustrating things that an author has to do is to navigate the editorial process, because the editor wants to cut this out, and wants to change this, and wants to change that. Let's look about what the Torah, what the Talmud says, and see the traditional Jewish aspect as to Moses' role in the Torah. And then let's see, well, how strict of an editorial guide, uh, guide and oversight would that be if Moses was the author? Okay, so the Mishnah tells us in Sanhedrin that um, there are several people that lose their portion of the world to come, and uh, one of them is someone who says that the Torah is not from heaven, not divine. And the Talmud explains, where does he get that from? Uh, so it quotes a verse, For the word of God he has disgraced, he shall surely be cut off. Being cut off, the term being cut off, whenever it's uh, brought down from Scripture, it means cut off from the Jewish people. Um, and the rabbis, uh, 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 the rabbis explain, The word of God he has disgraced, this refers to someone who says the Torah is not divine. Okay? Fantastic. This is, the, this is the, the, the highlighted point I want to bring up here. And even if someone says that the entire Torah is divine, except for one verse, that the Holy One, blessed is He, did not say, rather Moses himself said it, this too was included in, quote, for, he, for the word of God he has disgraced. Well, the Talmud makes it clear, traditional Jewish perspective, is that if someone says that Moses is the author of the Torah, or even if Moses is the author of one verse of the Torah, they are repudiating a core tenet of Judaism. And then we have this guy starts off his book by saying Jews traditionally have said that Moses is the author. Could you imagine being the author of a book and having such editorial oversight that you can't even write one word? Well, I didn't realize that Jewish tradition was that Moses would... I thought, it does say in the Torah, does it not, that Moses wrote down this law. Doesn't it say? Oh yes. Yeah. So Moses wrote so, it down. But that doesn't mean he's the author. I mean, he's, he's the typist. Dic he's the stenographer. Yeah, he's right. the scribe. Yeah, right. He's a transcriber. He's not the author. Yeah. So the guy who writes, who types the book, is not the author, right? right? Yeah. But are we getting into semantics here? I mean, well, it's, I, but it's very important. Well, okay. It's very important because uh, the question: Well, how would Moses have known that? That's not the question. How would God would have known that? According <laughs> to the Jewish perspective. Um, and you know, and the, the Talmud is abundantly clear. And then he just start off his book by saying, "Jews traditionally have said that Moses is the author." The Jew who says that Moses is the author is the Jew who is rejecting Jewish tradition. It's just it's striking. Not only that, let's continue a little further. Furthermore, even if someone says that the entire Torah is divine, except for one nuance. Now, what's a nuance? So, a nuance is that Hebrew words. The vowels are in the form of nikudot, the little dots and dashes underneath the letters or on top of the letters in some instances. That's how vowels are. So Hebrew words are all consonants, and the vowels are in the forms of dots on, under them or on top of them or on the side. However, there are some exceptions to that where the vowels are actually in the, uh, presented as letters. Hey hey, and vav and aleph, exactly. There are some sometimes where... Uh, where vowels are indeed brought down in the form of letters. That's an example of a nuance, where sometimes the Torah can spell the same word with the vowels in a form of letters, and sometimes the vowels are gone, and, 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 and the vowels are in the form of nikudot, of little dots and dashes. That's called a nuance. And there's hundreds of times in the Talmud where the Talmud explains why was a certain word in the Torah written either with a vowel or without a vowel? In the form of a letter, that is. And if you look at a Torah scroll, any Torah scroll, they're all uniform. Sometimes it says, Na'ara, Nun, Ayin, Resh, and then Nohe. And, and then there's a comma under the, un, under the Resh to, make, to, to provide the vowel. And sometimes it's Nun, Ayin, Resh, He. 
where the letter, the hey, provides the vowel. If someone says that this is random, this is arbitrary, says the Talmud, they too are rejecting the divinity of the Torah. Furthermore, if someone says all the Torah is divine, except for this Kal V'chomer. Kal V'chomer is a is a Talmudic argument, a, uh, uh, a argument uh, based upon uh, uh, stringency and leniency, wherein if you find a stringency in a lenient matter, then certainly that same stringency would apply to a stringent matter. The Talmud has hundreds of these examples. This is ready from the Talmud. If someone claims that that's made up, says the Talmud, they're rejecting a base standard of Judaism. Furthermore, a uh, Zerah Shava, which is a Talmudic analogy of two separate laws that have the same common word in their respective biblical passages. We'll bring some examples of that, which is just fascinating. Yes, you have two laws that share a common word. That common word is an analogy that links those two laws together, and then that provides like a bridge where you could transfer laws back and forth. I will give a few examples of that forthcoming. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of those in the Torah, in the Talmud. And we'll see exactly how, how that actually works and, and what that tells us about, 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 about the Torah. But if someone rejects even one of those, says the Talmud, they too are saying, for the word of God is this grace. So, so, so what's absolutely clear is that from the traditional Jewish perspective, not only is the written document not from Moses, it's from God, but even the oral companion, which is the Kal Homer's those arguments, the Zerah Shavas connections of, of verses, even that is not Moses, right? That also came from Sinai. Moses just, is just delivering it. So, you know, just to, you know, to, just to, to, you know, just to make the claim at least that traditionally the Jews have never said that the rabbis came and they gave us oral Torah. They interpreted it for us. No, this too came along with the Torah. What the Torah is, is both the written and the oral, and the oral components and all of that is divine and that's what we believe. And we cannot reject that. We have to see why that's logical. I want to say, maintain your skepticism. But that is, that is the claim. So this is a huge fundamental difference from Christianity, right? Because we need the New Testament. Oh, of course. And, and, and what we'll notice is that there are hundreds upon hundreds of examples where laws are derived from common words. And the common words can be scattered anywhere. You have, a, you, have a, you have a verse in Genesis and a verse in Deuteronomy, opposite ends of, ends of the Torah. They happen to share a common word, and we learn tons upon tons of laws from that common word. There is no other book that could do that. There's no other book that has done that. And that's the foundation of our religion. Because I'll give you guys examples of things that all of us have all done, and we've only done it because it's sourced in the Torah, both the written the Torah in the hidden way with c- connected words, and the oral Torah unpacks that by demonstrating that what is essentially hidden within the written Torah. So what, do you mind? Go ahead. If, if, what specific, I was just about to say. <laughs> okay, I'll give you an example. Yes. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example here. Okay. Uh, everyone, most people here, I assume, are married, right? They're married. Okay, how, how does marriage happen? Now, what changes from the the man and the woman being not married to being married? The ceremony. The ceremony, okay. So there's the ceremony, there's the chuppah, there's the rabbi, there's the, right, there's the rings. The contract. There's the kind of suba contract. So what actually makes them from not married to married is the presentation of the rings. And the accompanying verse, Hare at Mikudesh Libat Bazu Kadash Mosh of Yisrael. A man says that to the woman, gives her the ring, and they're married. Okay, okay, but didn't marriage predate the Torah? True. But how, but the fact that marriage predated the Torah doesn't mean that the process of marriage predated the Torah. Okay, so it became, okay. And indeed, the process of marriage did not predate the Torah. Okay, where do we know that from? I want you to spend. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year, looking throughout the written Torah for any teaching, any reference, any hint of this process. And you know what? You won't find it. Oh, there is. You won't find it. <laughs> it's, it's there. It's written clearly, but you won't find it. Because the written Torah has everything that the oral Torah has, but it's all encoded. It's all encrypted. It's all hidden. And you won't find it because you're not trained to find it. And you won't find it because you 
you don't have the unpatched version. It's 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 an enigma code, right? That's a good question. We'll have to get that as well. But let's first say what, and then we'll get to why. Good question. Very good question. First, let's figure out what. Okay, it's there. And I'll show it to you, and you're like, whoa, I didn't see that. But I can guarantee we could spend the year, all of us together, going through word by word by word by word, and we'll find it. I'll tell you where it is. Something that is that elusive almost seems to be um, useless. Well, uh, the well. It, can't find it and make use of well, let me ask you a question. If I, if, I, if I am trying to transmit, Janet, if I'm trying to transmit to you an encoded message that I don't want Dan to know, I might say some gibberish which may be useless to him, but it won't be useless to you because you know how to understand it. The Torah, indeed, is an encoded message. And it may be useless unless you have the decryption code, this which is, is the oral Torah. All right. Well, this is a little I'll, different. Let me demonstrate. Th- this was sounding like, you know, there's books that have been written called the Bible Code. Uh, that no, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm not getting to the Torah predicting what, no. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. No, not not that. That's no, no, not no, that's, that's, okay. no, that's not what we're talking about. That's. Okay, well, let, let, let me show you how this works, and we'll see, and we'll see if makes, this makes any sense. Okay, the verse says in Deuteronomy chapter twenty-five, "Ki yikach ish isha," when a man shall take or shall marry a woman. Yikach, remember that word. Yikach, kach. Um, fine. Means take. To take. Yeah, that's, yeah, right, I mean, that's right. That's right. That's uh, right. Fine. How do you? How do, does does it, does it describe how a marriage happens? No. It just says when a man marries a woman, and then it goes on to talk about well, what if he doesn't like her, and he wants to divorce her, etc. Uh, so, uh, so that's what that's what it says. Now, in Genesis, we just read a few weeks ago, we have the story of Abraham trying to purchase a burial plot for his wife, and he goes to a fellow by the name of Ephron. Right? And he says to him, oh, you have this table, I want to buy the cave from you. And they negotiate at first, Ephraim says, well, take it for free, we're good best friends. Abraham says, no, I don't, want, I don't want any gifts from you. He's like, well, I'll charge you like $100 million. He's like, oh, okay, yeah, between me and you. <laughs> so he pays him 400 shekels. She- silver shekels. Nasati kesef hasade kach mimeni. Remember the word kach? That's what the verse says. It says the Talmud, these two totally disparate verses are linked by the word kach, because of the same word, and thus the Torah is making a connection, and just like that happened with money and monetary equivalent, so too marriage happens with money and monetary equivalent. Thus, when it says, ki yit kach ish isha, when a man t- shall take a woman, how does that work? The same way it worked, it worked the other time that verse was used, that word was used. Now, like I said, it makes sense to us now, okay, we see the same word, Right? But if we were actually reading the book, we wouldn't pick up that message because there's too much information and it's, you know, and in, in the context of both, it, you know, works as an, in, the, in the form of a narrative. So we wouldn't, we, we wouldn't pick that up. So it's there, it's plainly written, but it's encoded. And uh, the oral Torah says, well, kicha, kicha, mistay afron. We learn the word kach from kach, from, kach from the field of Ephron to tell you that marriage happens with money or monetary equivalent. But, but it is in a ring. Well, okay, so the ring, that was where, where the ring comes from. So, so indeed, you, any monetary value you give, money or monetary value... You can just bring $100 bills to the... That's bill. indeed. It's just not, not all that romantic. What, um, what actually, um, what the Talmud does talk about is, is it's the importance of the woman knowing how much it's worth, which is why, by the way, Traditionally, for thousands of years already, the Jew, uh, Jews have always had the tradition of make uh, the custom of making uh, the marriage with a ring, but without a stone in it, because a stone can, uh, the, you know, the value, the fluctuation of value, or, or at least the misunderstanding of value, can vary wildly. So, you, so the woman has to know what it's worth, because essentially, if this is some sort of transaction, and she'll say, well. I thought it was worth, I don't know, 20 grand when really it's only worth 5,000. That's a problem. And that happens more when you have stones. That's why engagement rings are always with the stone, but the marriage is always just a wedding band. I get that about once a month in my shop. Well, people don't know. People just, yeah, that's right. That's already, that's already brought down it's in the Talmud. It's already 2,000 years old. 
So that, you know, that's why you know the idea of a of, of a ring um, came from there. But indeed, you could do whatever you want. Means if someone someone walks under the chuppah and says, "Behold, you are bequ- you are uh, betrothed to me with this five dollar bill," right? And she's like, "Oh, okay." And she takes it, and there's witnesses and the rabbi, and everyone sees she is married. No two words about it. <laughs> They are fully betrothed. Now, there's been tradition t- to use a ring, and that's why we use a ring without a stone. And by the way, it, the man better be the owner of the, of the ring because if he's not the owner, then he's not the husband either. Okay, it, it can't be something borrowed. In other words, it can't be something borrowed. That's right. It's got to be that he owns it, and thus he has the right to give it to her. If I take someone else's ring, I'm not the owner. So therefore, I, the 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 the, ma- the marriage cannot be conferred back to me either. Can the person make the ring? How does this become a little complicated? As long as they own it. Oh, you just said. Yeah, and as long as long as it has some monetary value, right? If if you know if if, if someone gives you a scrap of paper, that's not really worth anything. If someone gives you uh, pencil uh, uh, carvings, pencil shavings, it's not worth anything. Uh, but if a gumball, that would be enough. Once again, not so romantic, not advised, but that theoretically would be enough. <laughs> don't, don't take any marital advice from me, like, but theoretically that would be enough because that has the value. It has some sort of value. It's not a lot of value, but it has some sort of value, and that would be enough because that fulfills the category of kesef as demonstrated in these verses. So is romance mentioned in the code, or it has to be, it has well, to be it's, romantic? Uh, how, can they, how can it be romantic when they fix them up all the time? I mean... When I was in Iran over there, the Jewish people were betrothing their daughters at nine years old yeah. so the damn Muslims wouldn't get in there. Yeah, well, that's that's <laughs> that's true. That historically, there has been some instances where where there's been arranged marriages, but that's only because for two reasons: either because the halacha says that it's illegal for a man to marry off his daughter when she's when she's uh, when she's a child. Now, even though technically a man can actually do it because they have the rights. But it's illegal. And the only reason why they would do it is because otherwise they would be a fair game for any, any one of the, uh, uh, of, of the Gentile uh, uh, lords, number one. Or number two, the only other reason why someone would be allowed to do that would be because if they can only uh, afford a dowry or for the wedding expenses today, and then they know that if they cannot afford the wedding expenses tomorrow, their daughter will remain single forever – then that will be the other exception. But either way, even though theoretically a man could could could, could marry off his daughter uh, when she's young, he's not allowed to, and he would only be allowed to do in in any way in circumstances. What is the age of the Kenyan? Well, well, she becomes a, she should marry herself off, and she decides who she wants to marry, mm-hmm. and she becomes an adult um, by the time she's uh, twelve, according to Jewish law, and then she's in her own hands. So she decides her own fate. It's once again not, a, not advisable. Offered to get married that young, at least not nowadays. But um, theoretically, once someone is an adult, they're an adult. They Smart can do whatever they want. Smartphones have disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting because the women uh, of today, the girls of today, menstruate younger. They actually, if you count menstruation, which is something they have. Yeah. So although they would need uh, both, we need. We need both physical signs of maturation and age uh, from the halachic perspective of adulthood. Uh, I, ironically, if someone is, it could be 16, but not have uh, uh, physical signs of adulthood, then they would also not be considered an adult by halachic standards. Then they could be 9 or 12 or 11 and have the physical signs of adulthood, but not be considered adult because they're not, they don't have to have both age and adulthood. And by the way, like we say, women, girls are menstruating younger and younger. Um, the Talmud talks about uh, people, w- girls that had babies at the age of 8. Yeah. By the way, in 1939, there was a, a, a young girl who was five years old who, had a child. who had a child. Yeah. Oh dear Lord. Huh? Oh dear Lord. Yes, I, I agree. But uh, I'm saying the fact I mean, it's, it's not science fiction. Where was this? This was in the United States. Or yeah, 1939. A five-year-old girl. She had a. Uh, you would have to ask yourself how. 
Well, they have to have some abnormality. Of, you know, they were born with it. You know, but they develop. They develop. Listen, it's obviously abhorrent. Everyone knows that. Yeah. We all agree. But I'm just saying well, the was fact it that Tommy. Was it yeah, they, there's a whole there's a Wikipedia article about it to find out who's the dad, and everyone says is the father, is his uncle, is the cousin, is it? I was trying to figure out the but you know, but apparently this kid was, was fine. It was a very young romance. I, I don't know. It I mean, wasn't it was, a very young no, that's not I mean, a very I'm young romance. That's uh, a very dis, you know, very disgusting yeah. episode. But either way, move on. Let's move on. Yeah, but um, but either way, the, yes. So that's. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, because I have a seven-year-old, and I'm ready to spend something. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Let me see somebody doing it. That book, you won't find the guy anymore. No, yeah, exactly. Well, it does make it interesting that there are tons of movies that are around which these marriages can take place. So yeah, this and... This is not something I've heard before, so this is interesting. Uh, well, yeah, but, but well, like we said, it's illegal there for a man to do it. And they only would do it in certain setting and circumstances. Either way, so let, let's get back to the Torah here. Um, huh? Well, that's just one example, but there's hundreds upon hundreds of su- such examples. I was just learning a, a piece of Talmud recently. It's talking about a woman who was raped, right? What happens when a woman is raped? So she's, huh? No, she's not liable. She, he, well, he, he, well, no. Once again, if she wants him to marry her, she can demand that. And then he he loses his right to divorce her if she doesn't want him. So once again, that might be slightly misrepresented. Uh, what would happen in ancient times when a woman was raped? Well, she would never get married. Well, she would be she damaged would goods. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Where Dam- is that right. Right. So the Torah says that if a man rapes a woman or a girl, and she wants to marry him, she can demand, and he cannot opt out. And you can't divorce her. He so can't, the courts, unless she and wants. the courts will. Ad- oh would yeah, and Edrin would enforce her. Uh, that would be that would be enforced, us, and he would have to treat her the same way he you know treats uh, a. Uh, uh, so this is an example of where it's flipped on its head. Oh, she has to rape. No, she doesn't have to marry him. So but, much for the Torah being uh, anti-women. Right? Yeah, I'm yeah, saying it's, I mean, it can be presented like, well, the woman got raped and now she has to marry him. That's not what it says. It says that if she wants to, she can marry him. She can demand to marry him and he can opt out. And you know what? That provides her, uh, you know. The status. Exactly. Because, yeah, because otherwise, she, you know, she would be damaged goods. And she could be as ugly as sin, right? And he can't divorce her. And he's got to take care of her, you know. And and he's obligated by all the all the rights that uh, that every uh, uh, wolf, willfully married spouse is obligated by. Well, suppose yeah, she chooses. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Suppose she chooses not to marry him. And she's damaged goods. Where, where does that leave her? Well, I'm saying it's very unfortunate, of course, when something like that happens. Um, You're blaming her. No, we're not blaming her. So what the verse says is that uh, it's talking about actually a married a married woman who was raped, uh, and it says that she was raped. So therefore, obviously, she's not liable. Right, and so the girl don't do anything. Right, we execute the the rapist, but we don't do anything to her. Ain lanara chait mavis. It adds four words that the girl has no executable uh, sin. Talmud asks, why does it say those extra four words? If it says don't do anything to the girl, we know you don't do anything to the girl. Why do you have to add ain lanara chait mavis? She has no executable sin. To explain why you don't do anything to her. Well, well, we know because she was raped. It already says don't do anything to her. Talmud. Uh, so I just saw this Talmud. Talmud learns out a law from Ain Lenara Chait Mavis four laws. Once again, those are encrypted. If you just read it, you would have no idea how to derive all these laws. The Talmud unpacks that for you and says Ain is one law, Lenara is another law, Chait is another law, Mavis is another law. So, who is the one? Well, that's the thing. It's not, and no one made that up. That's Moses. Moses gives them both. He gives them the encoded version and the decoded version. He gives them both, and they're able, therefore, to have a vibrant. The Talmud was just the writing down of it. It was just written down then. So you're saying that Moses memorized Talmud while still in Mount Sinai? Yeah, that's Moses. Moses got that from God, gave it to Jewish people. Oh, and we have, so I'm ask yeah, of course. Question before we move on, what happens if a woman is raped? In this case, you're talking about a married woman, but whether she's married or whether she's not, and a child ensues from that experience. What happens to the child? How is that child regarded in that society? That's a 
the question because because man. she's a married woman, right? So we don't know who the child comes from, correct? Well, no, she said married or unmarried. Well, I know, but yeah, she said married. She said but married. Oh, you your, said married. Your example was a married, married woman. That's right. Woman, so I whenever we have a mar a married woman, um, we always assume that the child that is the product of her husband, because yes, yeah, she may have been raped, but she most likely you know had slept with her husband more frequently than with the rapist, correct? So it's 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 going to be an instance where we're going to Depends assume the, the child belongs to the to the dad. And if she's an unmarried woman, so she's an unmarried woman, then nothing, nothing happens. Child's fine. The only problem, the big right, problem is, so go ahead. Stigma, stigmatized with the mamzer, right? Yeah. So a, mom, a mamzer can only result from a from a uh, a relationship forbidden on pain of karis, which means. If a, if an unmarried man and or even a married man, but I, I, the girl's unmarried, and they and she has a child out of wedlock, there's nothing wrong with that child. That child can become to be the leader of the Jewish people. He can marry whomever he wants. He can marry Cohen's daughter. He can marry a Levi's daughter. He can marry the Rosh Hashiva's daughter. He can marry the, right. He's fine. So who's responsible for the, bringing that child up? I, I'm confused on how an unmarried woman. Um, any status in this community? Well, listen, it's, it's, uh, it's clearly, um, it's not ideal. No one's going to argue that they were a deal. The <laughs> Shandai. Uh, but, uh, but and, and I don't think it happened frequently, at least not historically, um, but there would be nothing wrong with the child. The mom's there only results if a guy sleeps with his sister or with his mother or with a married woman, or, or something like that. Union. A forbidden union oh. by on pain of caris. So there's many examples. Someone sleeps with his daughter, God forbid, or, or his sister-in-law, or his aunt, or his granddaughter, or, or all the uh, the 15 or some odd different uh, uh, pr uh, prohibitions. Only that would result in the mom's there, and that's obviously very tragic. Uh, when parents can do things so terribly to actually mess up the lives of their kids because that mom's there cannot marry into the Jewish people. Unlike, not unlike, I would say, uh, the meth addicts that have children as well. You know, the kids are born with very little brain matter, and they have uh, high rates of uh, uh, high rates of, of, of mental retardation and lots of health issues, and they have dependencies from day one. Um, the parents have responsibilities to know that their actions impact their children. You know, whether or not that's in the form of who they sleep with or what they do while they're in while they're pregnant. What, the, the, the pregnant woman who drinks alcohol, right? So what does that say? You, that can result in defects in the child. What did the, what the child do wrong? Child didn't do anything wrong. But we live in a world where people have free will and their free will affects others. And the free will choice that the mother makes while she's in gestation affects the child. The child can be born with deformalities, and that's very sad. The child did nothing wrong. But that's the world we live in, where actions of parents affect the child. And that's even if a, if a woman decides she wants to sleep with her brother, that's a terrible thing. And the child will be a mamzer, and the child will not be, to, be allowed to marry into the Jewish people. He will not be allowed to. Could the child still become a great person? Yes. Can the style, child still become one of the leaders of the people? Absolutely. The Talmud makes it clear, if you have a mamzer who's a Torah scholar, they take honor and precedence before the Kohen Gadol, who's not a Torah scholar. It's a meritocracy, but they're still moms there because of the actions of their parents. Okay, so um, back to Moses <laughs> and back yeah. to the Torah. <laughs> but quick, quick, quick questions. That's not, uh, I'm not trying to disencourage uh, questions. This is great. Um, once again, the traditional Jewish perspective has been and always was that Moshe is just the delivery, he's the courier, he is the ch he's the channel, he is the pipeline who gives us God's Torah and in its written, encoded form, be in its decrypted and oral form. Uh, now, by the way, why does the Torah not start off with a preamble that says as follows, the very first words of the Torah, written Torah, that is, right? Vayidabrashel Moshe Lemur, or Lichtov. These are the words that the Almighty instructed to Moses to write. Is that a good question? It's a good question. So I should have started off, right? The very first one, like, this is the beginning of the book, and this is the book where God told Moses to write this. Now, the truth is, it does, actually does say that several times in Deuteronomy, that, you know, that God told Moses to write the whole thing. It says there's several verses uh, to that effect. 
Um, and indeed, the Ramban, Nachmanides, the great commentator on the Torah and the great Halachist and the great uh, commentator on the Talmud, he asked this question in his introduction to the Talmud. Indeed, it would have been proper for Moshe to write at the beginning of the book, and God spoke to Moses all these words saying. Now, the Torah is written in third person without an introductory phrase because Moshe did not write the Torah in first person. It wasn't like the book of Ezekiel, that where it starts off, these are the words of Ezekiel, right? right? Or these are the words of Isaiah, these are the words of Jeremiah, right? It wasn't written like that, it was written in first person. How so? Um, I'll give you a quote here. Um, for example, it is often said of Ezekiel, quote, and the word of the eternal came unto me, saying, oh, son of man, it's like Ezekiel is always called Ben Adam, and it says to Jeremiah, etc., However, Moshe wrote the chronicles of all the previous generations and his own storyline and his experience in third person. That's why it says, and Hashem spoke to Moses, saying, doesn't say Hashem spoke to me, saying. Why? Because it's as if Moshe is writing from an existing corpus, right? We believe that the Torah predates the world. This is a little bit of a subtle point here. The Torah is essentially the blueprint with which God used to create the world. Therefore, the Torah is an existing wisdom that Moshe essentially is copying almost from an existing work to, he's kind of bringing it down to, you know, to humanity. But it's not, it, it's, it's, not, it's not as if it's a new document. Therefore, Moshe is writing, and therefore he's a character, of course, in, you know, in the book, at least in the book that we're getting, the version that we're getting, but the Torah itself is an existing document that Moshe is as, as if he's copying. Now, what about Deuteronomy? <laughs> you look at Deuteronomy, you find that Moshe does talk about it in first person, which, by the way, is one of the pillars of the documentary hypothesis is that Deuteronomy is different than the rest of the books. Just Deuteronomy, for, for one, Moshe writes in first person. What's the deal? Well, what changed? Why in, in all the way till Deuteronomy, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, Moshe is in third part person? And then Deuteronomy, Moshe is in first person. Well, the answer, very simple answer that he writes, and we, we, I mean, we could be if we just read it around me once, it would be clear to us. Moshe starts off the very first word, the very first document of the very first sentence of Deuteronomy. These are the words that Moshe said, you know, at, you know, at the end of his life, at the end of the forty years. Thus, God tells him, "I want you to write your own words." It's as if there's a third-party account of a dialogue. And in the, in the dialogue, it would say, and the guy said, I come to you, right? I am speaking to you. It starts up saying, these are the words of Moses, and then it quotes Moses in his own words. And by the way, why would Deuteronomy have a little bit of a different flavor? Everyone points out, Deuteronomy is a little bit of a different flavor. You know why? Deuteronomy is the words of Moses. It's just transcribed in the same format. God tells Moses, write your own words. But it's the words, indeed, the first four sections of Deuteronomy are all a word for word of Moses' words. Because God said, I want you to write down your words. Voila, it'll look very different. Voila, he'll talk in, in first party, in first, first person. Are there any new laws that were in the first four books provided in Deuteronomy? Oh, yeah, of course. Of course, many, 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 many. Then people could say that laws came from Moses, not God. Well, um, in truth, they came. Let, let's say the Torah recounts all the mitzvahs came from Moses, correct? But first it came from God to Moses, then Moses to us. So if we chronicle the the, uh, uh, the teaching that Moses gave to us, remember Moshe taught us. It's not just in Deuteronomy where it says that Moshe taught. It's, a, it's in Vayikra, right? Moshe, right, right. The v- most common verse in the Torah. By Dabashel and Moshe Lamor, God speaks to Moshe to speak. Go tell the Jewish people. All the Torah, all the Torah we got from Moses, Torah received on Moshe, right? But Moshe is not, is not the is not the author. He didn't invent it. He just transmitted it to us. Vitaly, you made a point. But but I mean, I'm not sure. Uh, he went. I mean, I, I'm not sure. I, fig- I I I got the answer to his question in there in what you just said. I, I, I if if Moses had new created new laws in his own words uh, in Deuteronomy that weren't there before. I, I don't understand. I mean, I think Dan raises an interesting question. I don't, I don't understand how that's no, it, it's not the word of, it's not, it's the word of God. Moshe and, and told Moshe. us all the laws. However, 
God told him what to tell us. So even so the fact Deuteron- that so even if Deuteronomy records Moshe's lecture to the Jewish people, he didn't invent that lecture. The the the, the laws of those lecture, right? So yes, we're, what's the difference if we're recording what God tells to Moshe or we're recording what Moshe tells the Jewish people? Either way, it's the same. Transition, same pipeline. God tells Moshe, Moshe tells the Jewish people. So it's just his spin on the same laws. That right, but the there. reason why we record that, if you read, if you read Deuteronomy, is because Moshe is giving castigation to the Jewish people. Right, Moshe is about to die, and he's preparing the Jewish people for what's going to be once the Jews get into Israel. Moshe has gone. What's going to happen? So he's trying to prepare them for the new challenges that they're facing there. Interspersed with that is, 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 is mitzvahs, of course, but the bulk of the mitzvahs come in the same format as the rest of the Torah because they come after the fir- first four sections. There are some interspersed, but, um, uh, but most of them come afterwards. But indeed, what's the problem that we re- record some, uh, some of the transcript between Moshe and the Jewish people? That, you know, we know that everything came through Moshe to the Jewish people. Why is that any different? It's not. It's the same thing. Go ahead. <laughs> well, the, when the Jews when the Jews went into, uh, into Israel, they sort of destroyed a lot of communities to take over. How is that different than ISIS? Well, I'll tell you how. For one, it's different. They offer peace terms. They sue for peace. Remember, even Amalek, even the arch enemy of the Jewish people, the Jews are told they got to smite Amalek. Well, first he gave them peace terms, says the Rambam. And even this, even the seven, the seven nations, they off, they sue for peace. But aren't the ISIS people uh, giving? Pe- they say if you become part of the caliphate, we won't kill you. I mean, isn't that what? I mean, I'm not trying to equate one. I'm just saying, can't you make? Can't you make that? Or, or, what's that? No, but no, but, no, but come on. I'm saying, what's? No, but I'm saying, war. People die in war, right? Of course. Every war. Has there been a war that people haven't di- died? Here they just came in and these pe- the other people have been living there all this time. Well, it's, it's debatable, right? But yeah. I'm saying we, we, that's true. Maybe a lot of people have been living there, but they haven't been living there for time immemorial, right? Yeah. But that's, that's what happens, right? So they have a destiny that they have to li- have a line of Israel. They got, they, got, you know, they got engaged in warfare. Or they say, this is our land. We rightfully own it. And they do indeed rightfully own it. And some people, by the way, left. Do you know that? Some people left. And there was no war with them. Uh, but they they sued for peace. They sued for peace, and some people accepted, and some people didn't. And you know what happens when you have war? People die. That's right. That's right. So survival of the fittest. Well, not mean, survival of the fittest. That's what happens in war. Well, no, I understand. But yeah, the yeah, but the be- the the best the best uh, prepared wins, not necessarily the more right, morally right. Uh, well, that's true. biblical warfare, right? So what do we find? We find that. Uh, Who's leading them, right? They're a bunch of slaves. They're emancipated slaves. And what do they know about warfare? They remember they're also engaging in warfare against fortified cities. But if God's on their side, though, they can win regardless, correct? You don't think that uh, the, you don't think that it was. But doesn't ISIS believe God's on their side? True. So what? So what happens? Then people commit the worst atrocities because they think that God's on their side in history. But yeah, what? But ISIS circle uh, uh, Jerusalem and then start blowing uh, shofars. No, but the, the fact. Good point. <coughs> no, but the, the, so we'll, we'll wait if that happens. I guess. The fact that they claim that God's on the side doesn't mean that that's indeed true, right? Of course, of course, right? Of course. Um, but I, I would make the argument, <coughs> just to bring a little bit more modern t- modern times, that if you were if you were a betting man, um, and there was. I, I um, bet you I know what you're going to say. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, well, you go ahead. If you were a betting man looking at the surrounding hate, uh, enemies of Israel. The numbers don't add up. How well, no, the numbers the, don't the add God up. God has to be, it's got to be providential for 3 million to 7 million people to be able to def- uh, uh, not be defeated. Not only by that, I want to talk to one particular million. episode. Uh, one of the most, uh, it, there's no other way to explain what happened in June of 67. Mm-hmm. There's no other way to explain it. Because if you just look, if you were a betting man, it was May 25th or May 28th or May 29th of 1967. You would be predicting, and every one of us would be reasonably predicting that the, the, the destruction of Israel is forthcoming. They were much, much weaker. They had less planes and less experience and less battle, less battle tested, yeah. much less half of the army, not even less, much less than half the armies of, of the combined um, Arab forces, the Jordanians, the Syrians, and, and the, especially the Egyptians. 
Huh? And Dinarak. Oh, of course. Le- Lebanese and all that. They come join, join the party. Um, and that they beat them all. And they beat them all resoundingly in six days. Can you imagine? Six days? And they quintupled their, their, their land. Yeah. Everything not, went well. But it, even 1948 would you know have that, been huh? oh, the number. As well. They had nothing. They had nothing. Yeah, they, had, they even had know, roads. <laughs> they had absolutely they, they had. Remember, they, Jerusalem was under siege. The Jews in Jerusalem were being starved, and there was no medicine, and they were being, and you know, and they and they couldn't even get basic foods and medicines there because uh, because the you know the path to Jerusalem is through mountains and valleys. Well, they had Kirk Douglas. Oh, they did, right? Uh, but um, the Arabs would stand on the ro- on the mountaintops and just stop every convoy, just shoot them. And well, the Jews said, "Yeah, it's nice to have yeah. a, that vantage point." And you know what the Israelis said? Screw it, we're going to build a road overnight. Yeah. yeah, in one night. That's it, on the mountaintop. Right. <laughs> desperate time calls for desperate measures, right? You know that <laughs> they spend uh, four months trying to fix a road, like a little patch of road here. You know, <laughs> well, they said we're making one road from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem in one night. Talk That's about it. Miracles. Now, listen. When I was in Haifa, I talked to a fellow that was in the '48 war. He said they surrounded 300 Arabs in this big motel complex, and they had one bullet. Not one bullet did they, the Israelis have. They were out. That's it. So one guy had the gall to go up there and tell them in Arabic. If you don't come out here and throw your guns out that window, we're going to invade and wipe every one of you out. <laughs> That's a great story. That's a great story. Well, there's there's a, there was a story with the uh, with a, co- a tank column. Um, I think this was in Yom Kippur War. I'm pretty sure it's Yom Kippur War. A tank column heading from Syria, and there was absolutely no defenses. They could have walked into Haifa and gone straight to Tel Aviv. There's no one there, and they just for whatever reason stopped and turned around. There's another episode of one tank taking on like 35 tanks, and somehow he managed to confuse them. They thought there was a barrage of tanks, and they just turned around and ran away. We, yeah, they, Israel almost yeah, put them in, in the Yom Kippur. Oh, yeah. They, they were almost finished. They were almost finished. That's right. That's right. But um, my, my point is, is that a for sure biblical war and the wars the Jews have had over Israel in biblical times – they were governed by more than just brute strength. And even today, I would make the argument that they're governed by more than just brute strength. Uh, when you have 39 Scud missiles, right, in 1991, falling from Iraq, that could have, each one of them could have killed hundreds. And the only guy they killed was this, was this messianic guy who was trying to put up posters for JC in Israel. It's the only guy he killed. He wasn't even Jewish. I didn't even That's the him. only guy. Amazing. It's unbelievable. Right? That's the only guy, right? Saddam Hussein says, you invade, uh, well, I'll invade Kuwait, you invade us, we're shooting Scud missiles at Israel. Okay, he shot 39 Scud missiles, he killed only that guy. <laughs> like, so what's the, I don't know, okay, I don't know. You, point? My, my, I mean, my point uh, is like this. My point uh, is that uh, even today, there is an argument to be made. I'm not saying for sure. I'm saying there is an argument to be made that the battles that Jews have over Israel is more than just about military might. Well, and I would say for sure, from the Jewish perspective, the battles the Jews have had in, in history were for sure more about just military yeah. might. Remember, they, they surround the city of Jericho and they start blowing children. From a military flat. standpoint, I think it's pretty agreed, and I'm no military expert, but I've read this, that Scud missiles are not regarded as very, very uh, yeah. high-quality True. military weapons. True, uh, but 39 you know, not, not hitting anyone, that, not killing anyone. Well, it's, okay. it's remarkable. Yeah, okay. okay. The Russians made them. Well, that... They blew up well, too, well, hard, too high in the air before they came down. They would come down as trash. Okay, so what, so what actually happened at Sinai, by the way? Important for our discussion. What did the Jews actually get at Sinai? They got the Torah. So they got the revelation, of course, the prophecy, wonderful experience. But they heard God's voice. They heard that God's voice. They got uh, assurances that Moshe was a legitimate prophet. They got the Ten Commandments, Ten Mitzvahs, fantastic. Uh, but they get any, what did they get in the form of written Torah? Well, the Ten Commandments they got... Um, Orally is right, but was that written down? Maybe it was written in the form of tablets, the stones, right? right. The tablets, right? Okay, but the tablets. Remember, the tablets came down and they were smashed. But they didn't. He write another, another, and they wrote another one that came ninety days later, right? Yeah, but it's still. It was still okay, written. so that's but that's I'm saying out of the whole written Torah, that's very little. So and indeed, the Talmud tells us that the written Torah was either one opinion says it was written incrementally, 
So Moshe came down from the mountain and wrote all the way up to Exodus chapter 24. And then as time went along, he wrote down incrementally. And at the end, just finished it. Uh, now the other opinion was that Moshe wrote the whole thing at the end. So there's an opinion of the Talmud that says that Moshe didn't write any of the written Torah. So what, what kind of Torah did they get at Mount Sinai? It was, it was there with oral Torah, which means what to do as a Jew, how to live as a Jew. And the Ram describes to us in great detail how this actually happened. This is Maimonides from his introduction to his commentary to the Mishnah. Quote, Moshe is in, is in, is in the assembly. And he's, he, God tells him a law, all the applications, all the examples, all the exceptions, etc. of the law. And he calls an Aaron. And he, tell, he teaches it to him. And then Aaron sits down to his right. And then Elazar and, he, and Isamar, the, the sons of Aaron, they come in and, and Moshe teaches it again. And then they sit on his left. And then all the elders come and Moshe teaches it a third time. And then they, they sit also there. And then all the people come and Moshe teaches it a fourth time. Then Moshe leaves, and then Aaron teaches it, the whole thing, to everyone who is assembled. And then he leaves. And then Elazar and Summer, they teach it a third time to everyone else. And then they leave, and then the elders teach it to everyone a fourth time. So indeed, everyone hears it four times. Aaron hears it four times from Moses. Right? Aaron's children hear it three times from Moses, once from, uh, once from Aaron. Right? The elders hear it twice from Moses, once from Aaron, once from Aaron's children. And the uh, uh, the, um, the the whole people here. Once from Aaron. Oh, the whole people. Once from Moses. Three or four million people, right? How yes. Well, they like no. What they had, they have, they had. Even times of Talmud, they have, they had uh, what's called maturgamon. A maturgamon is a, is an amplifier. That's someone. Uh, it's like a, it's an ancient form of uh, of amplification where you where Moshe would say something and then someone would stream it and then someone else would stream it. Uh, yeah. So that's, this is a very so everyone, go ahead. Of knowledge, right? Yes. So even if this older Moses was maybe was, he was able to remember it, right? I was having trouble with everybody else trying to remember it or being able to remember it as is with accurately. No like kicking the letters or kicking words. Or that's right, that's right, that's right, that's right. So, just, um, so and what happened after what this? Yes, yeah, so we'll talk about the safeguards in a second. So what happened afterwards? Afterwards, so they all heard the law and then they would split, split up into groups and workshops and, and ask questions and, 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 and repeat it again and again until everyone knew it perfectly and they would, obviously, if they had questions, they would talk to, their, to, to the leaders, uh, etc. This, this is one, like, part of Oh yeah, oh yeah. Like the, the, the Mount Sinai was a twenty four seven yeshiva. Where everyone's just studying Torah. And by the way, the Jewish people are called out. The Jewish people are reprimanded because when they left Sinai, they were so excited to leave because they were so sick. Like, like the way it's described, Katino kaburech mebeta sefer, like a child running away from school. They're there for an entire year of nonstop study, and then the Jews, there's, there's a little bit of a criticism of the Jews. When they leave, they're finally like, oh, thank God we're done with that. That was so intense. Um, and he gives it in my mind as an example. So like the Torah says, sit in a sukkah, right? So what's a sukkah? What does it look like? What's it made of? What is it composed of? Well, what is the schach made of? How tall? How big? How, right? It said all those questions. Moshe clarifies them. The people hear it once from Moshe, once from Aaron, once from Aaron's children, and once from the elders. And I tell me very little about Moses' children. Huh? Because I never heard about Yeah, well, Moshe, what's interesting is that Moshe's children, Moshe actually had a plan uh, to have his children be his successors. Uh, but God told him, no, your kids are not going to be successors. Mm-hmm. Joshua's going to be your successor. Um, uh, Moshe's kids were fantastic Moshe people. No one right. Well, no, the uh, Levim, the Levites, those are descendants of Moshe. If someone is a Levite today, they're a descendant of Moshe. And probably if someone's not a Levite, they're also a descendant of Moshe. Why, why, did, why did God not want his kids to be? Well, it's remember, it's meritocracy, right? So Joshua is the most capable. And even though Aaron, Aaron merited that his son, he saw his son being his successor. Uh, but Moses didn't have that. Moses didn't have his own, his own son fill his shoes. Uh, but Joshua was a, uh, a consummate leader as well. And who was he the son of? Joshua, the son of Nun. I don't even know who Nun is. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, but he, you know, he was he was the most worthy, and therefore he was uh, he was the one that was chosen. Um, and by the way, at the end of forty years, 
uh, Moshe gathers everyone together again, and they have once again another almost year-long study session where, huh? Exactly. Everyone knows Moshe's about to die. Ask all your questions now. And then a whole other year almost of, of study um, uh, in Arvos Moab, in the plains of Moab, where Moshe's about to die. Let's clarify everything here before we're done. That's essentially Deuteronomy. That's Deuteronomy describes that, uh, that, that process. Okay, so that's how, the, so, so essentially what we're saying here is that Moshe at Sinai, we got the Torah, what do we get? We got the Torah. What's the Torah? The Torah is what God wants to give us, right? The knowledge that God wants to give us. The form that it takes is A, a written form, and B, an oral form, but both of those things are identical, the two sides of the coin. It's the message that I want to transmit to Janet. Right? And I want to do it in multiple ways. One way that she can understand it clearly, and one way that maybe it's encrypted, that she can understand it if she knows how to decrypt it. And the question that Lydia asked was, well, why would we have to have both of them? You know, why, why this hybrid model? Like, what, what's, what, why, why are we overcomplicating it? Why don't you just write it all down and just have it or oral? Why is it such a unique method of uh, of conveyance, of transmittance, of information, and why is it so? And a lot of other questions. Write it all down, of course. And why not just put all the myths of it, just line them all up, and then say, and then here's the history uh, lesson. We'll, we'll put that at the end so we know the history of the people. That's right. So, well, I would argue that, that the history of the people is also lessons. The whole thing is lessons. Yeah, the whole Torah being intended is lessons. They it all together. It makes more simple to say, here's all the laws. Boom. Yeah, so the, well, the, that's the question of the written Torah, per se, right? The fountain in the old Torah as well. Um, because Oto is going to be unpacking that. Uh, but I think the, probably the answer to your question is that it has to, remember, the, to, the written Torah is, is manages, manages to do something that no other book in history has ever done. And that is to have these layers in which you could read the written Torah in English, right? Um, or you can listen to an audio book of the written Torah and it makes sense. Yet it's the most dense document because it has in it all of the 63 books of the Talmud are included in it. And all that's hidden, it's hidden beneath the surface. And all that is kind of shoehorned, not shoehorned in, but it's all found. It's, it's all there, but it's just hidden beneath the surface. So there is a narrative uh, element to the Torah as well. Remember, you have to read the whole stories of Genesis and not take any lessons out of it. You read the stories of, of Joseph and not ask any questions and not take any of the lessons. Because it is a story. It's interesting. Very interesting. You can just read it on that level. Mamadi says in his introduction to the Mishnah, Go ahead. Lucky, that the reason it's so encoded is so that uh, less educated, intelligent people wouldn't get the message. But then that brought the question to me of like, well, why not? Why would, if someone was more of a simpleton or educated person, would you not want to make it more. Uh, User-friendly, That's an amazing question. I want to actually have that later on my notes to talk about. Other people that are reading it later on to not have to have that code. I think one of the problems we have in our society today, and that is we have the Torah, and then we have other people who transcribe it, and they're fundamentally different. And so we have a whole society of people that are reading different documents, and it's coming away with profoundly Yes. And that's scary. That's right. Okay, so let's, so let's talk about this. This is really where we wanted to get to. Everything else until here was an introduction. This is where we start. I think the introductions are getting longer and longer. <laughs> okay, so what would we say would be God's intention uh, when he gave us the Torah? Um, more specifically, would God want it to uh, be understood? Would God want us to forget it? Will God want continuity or not? Clearly, we would argue that if God's going to give us the Torah in the way that it's going to be the guidance and the instruction and the um, uh, you know and the vision for perfecting the world, it's got to outlast everything, right? So obviously, continuity. Is- continuity for sure, right? Yeah. You would for sure argue that God wants us to understand it and to not make mistakes and have clarity. And have clarity. That's right. Now. Well, what's the best way to do it? Write it down, right? Simple. Can't, you can't go wrong. Or can you? How many times uh, has there been debates as to the meaning of the, uh, right, uh, of, of, of the people that wrote the Constitution? Are we talking about what the definition of the word is? 
Well, that would be one. <laughs> uh, but I'm okay. saying every single day there's debates in front of the Supreme Court. They're the experts, so to speak. What is constitutional? What's not constitutional? What does the word mean? Wait, this was only written, this was written down. And the, clearly the intent of the people that wrote it down was that it should be understood. Correct? Yeah, how come it's not understood? So to make the argument that just writing something down is the best way for it to be understood in the future, well, that's patently untrue. It's not the best way to do it. Well, okay, then just have, have an oral tradition. Well, is that the best way? What we'll find over here is that the best way to do it, in fact, the only way to do it, that it, sh- that, that it is guaranteed continuity, is if you have both the written, encoded, encrypted version and the oral, decrypted, decoded version. That's the only way and the best way to do it. And indeed, we claim, just the claim itself should be eye-opening. We claim that the oral Torah and the written Torah we have today is the same that Moses got at Sinai from God. That's what we claim. In fact, one of the 13 principles of faith, says Maimonides, says those are that the Torah that we have today is the Torah that Moshe got, and we're not changing it, and we never have changed it one bit. That claim is astounding, as to whether or not it's true, we have, to, we, have to, we have to look through the evidence. But the claim itself is just remarkable. We're claiming that while the Constitution was written 200 years ago and no one can agree, every, every vote split 5-4, split right? Incidentally, yeah, incidentally along partisan lines. Okay, but, right? um, but that's only 200 years old. And we know that the authors wanted it to be understood for eternity or, or at least con- continually. Yet we claim that we actually did it. We did it. Like not because of our genius, maybe also we contributed as well, but because this is the way God is going to convey such a vast, exhaustive corpus of information that's going to outlast everything. Exile, expulsion, persecution, right? Still we have a Torah, the same Torah. How so? Okay, so I want to just exam- examine some of the... Uh, uh, of, of the common Talmudic uh, questions that you would have. Every time the Mishnah brings a law, the Talmud says, where's the source of the law? Where's the source of the law? And it will always source it from the Torah. Right? Sometimes it sources it from other things like, like, uh, like uh, 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 reasons or Allah which is Sinai, which is just, it's, it's just a law from Moses at Sinai. We don't have it sourced in the written document. But most of the time it'll say, uh, where in the Torah it's sourced. And how would it source it? It was sourced in a way that's either an explicit verse or it's a verse, but you have to understand that this is an extra letter, one letter, one, one less letter, or a Zer Shav, an analogy, or Kalva Homer. There's 13 different ways that we can analyze verses. If you read that question, how is this law sourced? What does that tell you? That there's the source, and then we take the source, and we extract from that the law. Correct? Make sense? Yeah. Okay. And then you have the opposite question the Talmud asks. Just as frequently, we have the verse. What law is deduced from that verse? So where's the starting point? Do we start from the law and say, where's the law source? Or we start from the verse and we say, what's the lesson from the verse? It seems to be opposite. We start from opposite directions. Which one are we doing? The answer is both. That, because the interplay of the written and, and oral Torah is that they are reflections of each other. When you have a verse that's empty, that's not being used for anything, that's a problematic because there has to be a reflection in the oral Torah for that written word. Conversely, when you have a law that has to be sourced in the written Torah, they are indispensable of each other. One without the other is no good. But, it's a problem if you have a verse that's not linked to a law, and it's uh, equally a problem if you have a law that's not linked to a but, verse, because they are reflections of each other. I guess what I'm, and maybe I'm just not grasping it as well as I should, I don't know, but, but I mean, the Talmud... Well, uh, I understand the reflection aspect, I think, but the Talmud was written by men, right? That's right. It was codified by men. Okay, right. God wasn't... There's no argument in Judaism, is there, that God was, you know, in the room where the rabbis were debating, is there? Uh, well, there's no argument that, that... That's why not every word is divine, but the ideas are, are just writing down what has always been. Now, it's important to note, the because may, 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 this sounds fantastic, right? You're like, whoa! Somehow they managed to maintain the understanding of the written Torah and how it all connects to each other for thousands of years, right? What's very important to note is that Maimonides actually brings this point, is that the oral Torah was written down. Every generation was written down. 
Moses wrote it down, Joshua wrote it down, the elders wrote it down, all the people wrote it down. Everyone had notes. The only difference between the Talmud and all the various notes of the oral Torah throughout the years is the Talmud was finalized, canonized, codified. It was finalized. It was the authoritative writing of the oral Torah. As opposed to throughout the years, people wrote down their notes for memory, but it was not authoritative, finalized, canonized. So it was just more like a memory. A yeah, memory it means you would use it was notes for yourself. That's right. It was notes so for yourself or notes for your students, but it wasn't finalized. The oral the is considered the definitive. Finalized. Definitive. definitive that's right. That's right. The definitive or, or okay, authoritative. The oral Torah, I always thought, and this is where I apparently was wrong, I always thought the oral Torah was the Talmud, uh, and the written Torah was the the written Torah, and I didn't... Yeah, so the you know, oral Torah essentially is four components. It's the Mishnah, which is part of the, oral, uh, of the Talmud, which is the laws. It's the Talmud. The Talmud is all the examples of the laws, all the sources. The Talmud always links it back. It always shows the connections as well. Is it commentary as well? Uh, well, comment, we get to commentary in a second. Um, uh, that's number two. Uh, it's the so the laws, the sources, the ex- examples, the explanations, the exceptions, everything that relates to that law. Precedence, too? What do you mean? If it's a law, and so you, you need to give some precedence, example. Well, the, well, precedence in the form of sources in the written Torah, that's right, <laughs> if that's what you mean. No, no, not in the written Torah, but in the form of like ancient life. But well, but remember, this was not, this is another crucial point. I feel like there's so many crucial points here. Um, it's not something that was theoretical. This was day-to-day practice. I mean, when people wrote down what they did every day. They wrote down what film. They all wore film every morning, all of them. So to them, to write down the laws, it wasn't just, oh, we found some source that some, someone 100 years ago wore film. No, it was they wrote down what they did, right? A, a, you know, everyone observed the Shabbos. Therefore, the book of Shabbos was, was a finalized rendition of what exactly Shabbos is. I but it wasn't, it wasn't just theoretical. Well, that's a that's sort of more in terms of sort of in modern life of the civil and criminal code. What do you mean? Well, they had, but they, they remember they had, they had criminal laws as well. They had criminal and civil courts as well. In Talmud, in the ta- in the times the Talmud was written, all the people that were authors of the Talmud were also judges that adjudicated civil and criminal law. But it's not part of the Talmud. Oh yeah, you better believe it's part of the Talmud. A lot of lot of law, incredible amount of laws in the Talmud. Everything from stoning to. Everything no from you find a lost object to your animal or someone else's animal uh, to laws of partners that uh, went awry to laws um, of, of personal injury, etc., etc. Every detail, every detail you possibly imagine of someone injuring someone else or someone's money injuring someone else or someone losing something or someone finding something or documentation, documents, just and the laws of documents. Not, uh, written by, it was all developed by God. I mean, not Yes, yes, yes. This is this is just writing down that that was always existing. Uh, th- it's the corpus of knowledge that was always existing from the times of Moses. That's what Moses taught us. So and it was I, written down, like I said, it was written down progressively throughout the years, but it was never finalized and codified. So what you're saying is, for instance, Mount Sinai, God gave us the law what to do if I steal somebody's meal. 100%. And that's by the way included in the, in the written Torah. The written Torah talks about that, but all the details and all the nuances are just in the oral understanding of the written Torah. But what's remarkable about it is that it's essentially, like I said, it's it's two sides of the same it's, of of the, of the same uh, of the same information. You could actually take the written Torah without the oral Torah, but you understand how to study it, and you could find every little bit of the written Torah inside of it, everything. Well. Okay. There will be some examples of rabbinic edicts that they added as well. There will be some examples of rabbinic law. You won't find in the written Torah anything about Purim or Hanukkah. Those things came later. So with a few exceptions of what the rabbis contributed, either as a form of edicts, right, making a guard offense around the Torah, or with regards to rabbinic law. But if you knew how to read it, you would know, and you knew all of it so well that you could make all those connections by yourself, you could actually find the, written, the oral Torah all there. Similarly, you could read the oral Torah and you could actually deconstruct what the written Torah was, was as well because all that is reflected in the oral Torah as well. It means, and to make the claim, by the way, it's just, it just uh, to work backwards, back to where we started from, to make the claim that the written Torah was written by man, just to, take that as a, just to take that argument, if you read the oral Torah and you see how dense it is and how perfectly it all coexists, it's impossible for someone to be that brilliant. 
to actually have all these nuances and all these words that overlap and all these laws that are all, all these 63 books full of laws that are all derived from all these nuances in the written Torah and show, and, you know, it's, 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 it's the encrypted work. You, you, a man cannot encrypt, even a collection of men randomly put together by some redactor cannot encrypt uh, a, a, a document so perfectly. Well, you I would think that, well, you, obviously you do, but go all ahead. this encryption maybe was not encryption, and then man just played around with it, said, oh, look, this relates to that, this, you know, uh, maybe it wasn't meant to be that. Okay, but maybe, okay, but then well, how that all happened, it's all random, just randomly we could find so much, and by the way, all that's backed up by tradition, right? Well, you read like horoscopes and things like that, you can say... Yeah. Okay. Fine. You can find. You can find. But but an entire corpus of sixty three books of the Talmud. And remember, read the Talmud. It's very 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 dense. All that we have a book of Talmud called the Book of Gittin. Okay. You can spend your whole life studying the Book of Gittin. Okay. Well, the Talmud is one part of the Oral Torah. I, w- I said there's four parts. There's the Mishnah. There's the Talmud, which are linked together, by the way. Because Mishnah is all the laws, the Talmud is all the explanations and understanding of that law. Um, there's Halacha, which means what to practically do, not necessarily for the Book of Scholarship. And then there's Torah Sanista, which is the last realm, the last part of the law which is still oral. So where does Midrash come in? Is that a well, totally mi- separate yeah, Midrash thing? Well, yeah, Midrash will be part of the same thing, but Midrash is frequently going to be non halachic so more like the narratives of the Torah, the lessons, the ethics, the storylines of the Torah, what are the lessons that are linked in there? I'll call that part of the Talmud, but Talmud not for law, but Talmud for behavior. Where's the Gemara? A Gemara has, has everything of that in it. It has, the, it'll have the Mishnah. Mi, Gemara and Talmud are the same word. Yeah, I was about to say, so that's, that's right. synonym, that's right. uh, of, okay. All that's right. right. Sorry, but what was the fourth part? That you the fourth part is Torah Sanistar. Torah Sanistar is the hidden Torah. Which means the Torah, um, well, maybe sometimes called Kabbalah, but Kabbalah is the last frontier of the Oral Torah because it's the last part of the Torah that has not been written down. Maybe it is so fascinating. Uh, if if someone taught it to you, no one taught it to me, so I wouldn't know. Uh, I, thought, I thought the written form of that was the Zohar. Yes, yeah, so the Zohar is a foundational book, but even the Zohar is a sealed book unless you are instructed how to study it. If you got the idiot's guide to Kabbalah, you probably did get that, right? <laughs> um, the Madonna Road, that's right. So yes, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's scintillating, but it's, you don't really understand what you're talking about. Yeah, you can make these nice diagrams of like oh, Keter and Malchut. You really don't know what you're talking about. Really. You have no idea what you're talking about. And it's just a, a defiling of all that soul. I think. But true because it's the last frontier of the oral Torah. It's, it still has not been written down. Yes, you may have a document like the Zohar, which is written down, but it's written down in such a way where you still don't understand it. I think I got through one page once. How was that? Fantastic. Yeah, I didn't understand a word. Just now, <laughs> I, I, I want to make the argument. I want to make the argument that there's a new language as well. Uh, what language is the Torah written in? Hebrew, right? Correct? But the Torah is written, written in Torah language. It's Yes, it's in Hebrew, and you can read it in Hebrew. And by the way, I would say all the Bible critics read it in Hebrew. Unfortunately, by some of them read it in English or whatever, not in the original Hebrew. All the great Bible critics are all German, so they, are, they all must have studied Hebrew as adults, which is in itself remarkable. Why are we going to them as the... Why are they the experts? Why is suddenly the German style is the experts on, on, on the Bible? You know, people that learned uh, how to read Hebrew in their 20s. Okay, just a thought. But either way, the Torah is written in Hebrew, but it's also written in Torah language. Because to really read the Torah the way the Jews have read the Torah, you have to have the companion book. You have to find a way, you know, what is the decryption code to understand it. And that gives us the Talmud. What happens if you try to critique a foreign language in a language you don't understand? Or a language that you don't, you don't actually, you're not actually working with that language. Right? Can, can, can I try to decrypt a book written in Mandarin Chinese? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say I'm the expert. I know how to understand it and how to analyze it and how to critique it. I don't even read the language. The, the Jews believe that the Torah was written in Torah language. And we, we all, thankfully, ha, well, thankfully, but now we have the gift of having the decryption code, right? The, the, uh, the um, 
uh, the dictionary of this language. Like, and that's the oral Torah. That's how we read it. Critique that book. Critique the book the way we understand it. Okay, and let's analyze how many fantastic and unbelievable depths we find in the Torah and then try to challenge the legitimacy and veracity and historicity of the Torah. Don't take it in a superficial, in, you know, the superficial level of, of just one document, the one half of one whole, and then ask questions like, oh, th- we see things that are, that are, that are, not, that are not in order, at, at a chronological order. Yeah, if that's all, the only book you got, you may ask that question. You open up the Talmud in the book of Psachim, Ein Mukhtam Mu'ochabar Torah. The Torah is not written chronologically. And it's obvious. You look at cha- Exodus chapter 20, description of Mount Sinai experience. Exodus chapter 24, the description of what happened before the Mount Sinai experience. Right. What's going on? Is, is the author retarded? No, it's just the author is writing in a different language. And the language is called Torah language. Part of Torah language is the fact that it's not necessarily in chronological order. And I understand that the whole universe is made from the Torah. And if you, if you didn't have that jumping around like that, you, and you could understand it in the Torah, heck, we'd be having everybody making universes. Yes, and we even have uh, we have uh, we have docu- we have documentation of rabbis that knew how to use a book called Sefer Yitzira. Sefer Yitzira is the book of creation, yeah. and that's the book of how to make worlds and how to make universe and how to make things. Mm-hmm. And these two rabbis they would study the book of Sefer Yitzira every Friday afternoon, and they would create a young calf out of their study. And they would use that calf, and they would eat that calf on Shabbos. Nothing with no one idea of the limit. Like, <laughs> Why like, did they make the limit? Like, is it three D printing? <laughs> it's, 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 it's spiritual three D printing. <laughs> That's what they did. That's what they ate every You're Shabbos. Who Merlin? Was a rabbi, right? <laughs> Merlin. <laughs> no, I'm saying I don't know how to do that. But yeah, there are, it is. It is possible. Some people do know how to do that. I had a guy who was in my house on circus, and he told me that him and his 14-year-old son, study Zohar and study Sefer Yitzhira together. I tip my hat and I said, okay, good. This sounds like it'll end really nicely, you know. I don't know if maybe... It's, it's probably not. Uh, it's probably not a good fit. I make the argument, the dad shouldn't be studying it either. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so we have the gift of the Torah being dumbed down for us. Mm-hmm. It started off with Moses. Moses, only, the only thing that people had in their bookshelf was the written Torah. Everything else they had to do on their own. They had, to, they had to be able to take the written Torah and know all the laws out of the written Torah and how it all works and how it all made sense and how to actually apply that as well, which is another step. Came a time where that was impractical. They wrote down a part of it, which is the laws, the Mishnah. It came a time, and everything else was maintained in the oral form. <laughs> Came a time where that too was impractical, they wrote the Talmud. And how to use the Talmud, that too was left to the oral form. Thus, if you wanted to know a law, halacha, how to actually behave out of Talmud, you'd have a very hard time doing it. You know why? Because Talmud's very big. And, and Talmud's very dense. And you know what? The Talmud is akin, a, Talmud is akin to an encyclopedia that has everything in it, but the entries are not alphabetized. Not only that, the entries are taken, each one of them is cut into five pieces and scattered throughout the book. Unless you were an expert in all of it, you actually could not use it for law. That was done by design. That was done in order to, A, encourage scholarship, and not make it, not make it too easy, and B, that the, that the arbiters of halacha would be only the experts, because only the expert would have the whole picture. Only they would be able to reconstruct it and to make order out of, a, out of a particular law. You have a law that, remember, it's a, it's a very complicated law in itself, but you would scatter throughout the Talmud. There's a whole ocean. Where are you going to find it, right? If you want to find a needle in a haystack, that's what it's like, but you want to find five needles in five haystacks. So, you have no idea where to start. So, Unless you actually studied all the haystacks and you knew them so well, only then would you be able to, be able to extract from that halacha. So, halacha was a consensual law. I'm sorry? Well, how is written down is another question. But either way, if you have the Talmud, you have halacha. But it's all there, go find it. And thus, halacha too was maintained in its oral form. Comes along Maimonides, 
And he tells you, oh, now I have to write down halacha as well. I have to organize. i got to collect all those little needles and organize the needles. right? And then these needles and that needles from all these haystacks. And I will take all the laws and collect them from the Talmud and organize them, A, with the conclusions. The Talmud does not, doesn't tell you the conclusions. You know why? Because the conclusions are oral. That, too, was maintained in its oral form. The Talmud doesn't always tell you where to look elsewhere to find the rest of the, the rest of the misses of the piece of the, of the piece of the puzzle, right? So essentially, the halacha was all there, but it was still hidden. It was still oral. Comes along and says, "I will do the next step of writing down the oral of writing down the oral Torah and actually writing down halacha." Thus, the understanding, the unpacking of the Talmud was 500 years of scholarship from Rashi, names like Rashi, Nachmanes, Maimonides, Tur, Rush, all these names, culminating, of course, with Rabbi Joseph Cairo, that is another stage of writing of the Oral Torah, which is the Halacha. Until this day, which we're, doing the same, we're, doing, we're doing that work of, of, the, of, of sort of the last stage of writing of the Oral Torah. But either way, each stage is, an incre- is, is, is incremental, right? We want to write down as little as possible. So let's write down just the laws, keep it very, very succinct, very brief, and then everything else maintained in its oral format. Three years later, we got to write down the law. We got to write down the Talmud, the standard explanation, exceptions, sources, everything. But let's still do it in a fashion which maintains the oral flavor. So the halacha is mysterious, right? Unless you're an expert in all of ta- Talmud, unless you're a, a, literally a world expert, you cannot extract halacha. Comes along Maimani says, well, that's too hard. Let's write down halacha. I'll collect all that and organize it for you. And there's 500 years of that. So today, like I said, it's much easier. That's your question, uh, Betty. It's much easier today to study because we can go to the written Torah and read it and read Rashi. You know what Rashi does for us? Rashi collects everything, all the lessons from the Midrash and from the Talmud, from everything, and brings presents it to us on the verse. If we wanted to study the Torah a thousand or two thousand years ago, it would be much harder because we have to be experts in everything, either before the oral Torah is written down and all of oral Torah to understand what a verse is saying, or after the oral Torah is written down, you've got to be an expert on all the Midrash, the first of the Torah, the Torah, all the Talmuds, both Talmuds, Jerusalem, Talmud, uh, all that, it's all there, but it's all scattered. Comes on Rashi and says, okay, let me collect it. Collect it and bring it all in the verse. Ain't that wonderful? I want to know how to do it. How to wear the phone? Well, the Torah says wear the phone. What's the phone look like? Well, d- d- does it actually, it, it doesn't actually say to wear the phone, does it? It, does, it says the word Isn't totafot, which is the phone. Okay, but this I thought times. the source of that was um, the, you shall keep these words as frontlets between your eyes and bind them on That's a verse, but what does that mean? Once again, it's encrypted. Well, that's the thing. I understand that that, that, that the, the Talmud or somebody or something said this is how we interpret that. Well, not interpret it. That's what Moses told us how to word what the phone looks like. There's an encrypted version of the Torah, in the written Torah, and then there's a, a decrypted version of the oral Torah. But everyone wears the same film because everyone has the same interpretation. If they all came to the conclusion on their own, wouldn't everyone have their own film? How does everyone have the same film? By the way, like Bernie said, we found the film in the, in the, in the, in the, dead, in the dead, near the Dead Sea Scrolls. They're identical to our film. How is it possible that we all just guess correctly? No. It's because we were told how to wear the film and what film is. That's part of... How do I do it? What do I do with the left? Sorry, but this is a... Did you just drop it on the floor? There you go. Sorry about that. Um, um, so, so, yes, so we got the laws of how to wear tefillin in an oral form, and then it was actually encrypted in the written form but as well. And then they were reflections of each other. But if you wanted to do it, if you wanted to study just in the written Torah, you'd have a very hard time doing it. The oral Torah will explain how it all makes sense and how it all fits back into the written Torah as well. Is the Talmud the definitive? How do I ask this? It's a it, definitive it, Talmud. Uh, okay, but but I which guess, means what is the role of the Talmud? Well, but I guess now I'm I'm curious more about the process. Um, yes, they you got you had a bunch of of learned people debating things. Is my brother still here? Sorry. No, he he dropped yeah. that like an hour ago. <laughs> You go ahead. Uh, and and is the major and did they come? Did, was it was there like a majority of the people present made the definitive? Uh, because obviously, so the Mishnah disagree. was written in collaboration with a thousand rabbis. Okay. Okay. So and thus, they 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 had more? they had the existing uh, corpus. It means they had it. Right. And they they would indeed use majority rules uh, frequently, but most of the things is not is not is not subject for debate. It's just laws. What are the laws that everyone agrees upon? 
There was so very little was disagreement. They debating, right? So there were there were debates because, like we said, that's the reason why they had to write it down is because there were debates. Because debates only arose when the fluidity of transmission was interrupted. Right? Yeah, the Romans come and saying whoever teaches Torah publicly is going to be executed. Well, how difficult is it to teach to, to, to teach Torah accurately, oral Torah accurately, if you can't teach Torah publicly? Right? You have to, you have to, you, have to you, you know, you have to go underground. You have to use clandestine instructions. Well, that's very hard to, to do it accurately, and therefore there are mistakes that d- disagreements, and therefore we have to write it down before too many disagreements make it not a uniform uh, instruction. Correct. So um, to a- answer the question Lydia really uh, brought up many, many moons ago, why, w- why not write it all down, right? So we read, I, I, I have seven answers that why I came up. It? Yeah, well, why hide it? So number one, first of all, oral is about a form of instruction, clearly. All you guys went to university or at least to high school or to grade school, why don't you just read it from the book? Because there's something you cannot get in the form of oral, inf- of, 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 of vocal inflection that is a much clearer way of learning. When you read something, there is room for uh, ambiguity. I someone I went online. I found someone who had this sentence here. Uh, f- um, s- um, let's say the eight words, and it got five different meanings. Same eight words. I did not say I ate those cookies. I've never heard this one. I did not say I ate those cookies. If you say I didn't say I ate those cookies, well, someone else said it. I didn't say I ate those cookies. I might have thought of it. I didn't say I ate those cookies. I might have squashed them or right trampled them or sold them. I didn't say I ate those cookies, but maybe other ones. I didn't say I ate those cookies, but maybe I ate those brownies. Boom. Same word. Of the sa- word is. Same sentence has five different meanings when it's oral. When it's written down, it's much harder to convey that nuance. The Torah wants as much nuance to be able to convey it as possible. Number two. Number two benefit benefit of, of of having oral instruction over written instruction, that the principles are more fluid. When we we're studying the laws of blessings, remember the oral Torah is written down. There's a tremendous drawback of having the oral Torah written down because now all the examples are fixed, and therefore there can't be interchangeable examples because they're written down. It's fixed. So we're learning the laws of blessings, and we're learning about all these ancient dishes that are we don't know what they are. We don't know what the dishes are because those were the dishes that were common then. They're extinct now. And I have to figure out what those dishes were and how those principles apply to modern dishes. That's complicated stuff. Laws of damages. You read the laws of damages. It's all about animals goring animals. I don't know. Maybe you guys have pets. But how often does it happen that your, your ox gores someone else's ox? It doesn't happen <laughs> all that the often. All, it's all the time. Right? It doesn't happen that frequently in modern society. So... Our job today is a little bit more difficult because the principles are all there, but the examples are all, are all obsolete. That's the drawback of writing it down, that it doesn't, it, you know, doesn't change with the times. The principles remain the same, but the examples are fixed. Writing it down has that problem. Number three, someone mentioned this earlier, keeping it out of the hands of the Gentiles. When you write something down, it's very easy for people to come and start asking questions and say, oh, you, you know, the day the, Jews, the, the day the Jews were forced to write down the written Torah in, 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 in Greek is a day of mourning because now suddenly we have gotten nothing but grief from the Gentiles. Because, oh, it says this, it says that in the Torah. Some people write these, make these YouTube videos of like, oh, it says this in the Talmud, it says that in the Talmud. Well, that's a, very, that's a bad thing for us because a lot of, uh, a lot of anti-Semitism comes from people plucking out things out of context from the Talmud and presenting in it uh, you know, in videos as if they're experts and, and saying, oh, the Jews are anti uh, the Jews are uh, bigots, and the Jews are racist, and the Jews do this and that and the other, when they don't even understand it because, well, now it's out there in the open, and everyone could use it and twist it whichever way they want. Yeah, David Remember? Duke has done that with some videos. Yeah, so what are you going to do, right? So we you got to fight back, but, you know, but, but, but this creates a problem for us. When the oral Torah is oral, it forces people to work. It forces people to become scholars. Right? We don't want that our Judaism is all spoon-fed to us. Mm-hmm. You know, that's not what we want. We want room for growth as individuals. That is much easier in the, in, in the oral kind. That's what you have to study. You start off with zero. Every kid starts off as a total ignoramus. So if I'm studying Torah and I can speak uh, a word where I don't understand, the best thing to go to... Rashi. And I will tell you, even a verse that you do understand, you go to Rashi. 
Because you may understand that on one level, but there's maybe deeper levels for you to understand it, more interesting, more incisive, uh, more, uh, you know, greater lessons that you could glean from, from that verse. Yeah, so you're trying to find meaning in sacrifice in the sacrificial rituals. Yeah. Okay, so there's a, there's, there's an entire section of the oral Torah, right? Entire order, right? Sixteen percent of the oral Torah uh -huh. is dealing with those things. Yeah. There's a lot of information out there. Yeah. If you really want to do it, there's plenty of literature for you. Thankfully, today, uh, in the form of of ri written oral Torah, finalized, codified, you find everything you possibly want there. Look at Maimonides, what he says about sacrifices. Look at the commentaries, uh, like what further unpacking the form of the Chinuch. Uh, the Ramban has lots and lots and lots. The Ramban on the Torah uh, in, in Leviticus has lots and lots and lots of, of, of explanations of all those processes and every detail of the rituals, etc. Why is Rashi the last word? That's Rashi is not the last word. No, Rashi is not the last word. Rashi is not the last word. But the, the, f the, the role of the rabbis of the Rosh Hashanah, the medieval period, such of the year 1000 to the year 1500, is to make the Talmud accessible. A, Rashi makes the Talmud and, and the Torah really accessible by uh, giving us the explanation of just what the words mean, just definitions of words, mm -hmm. filling in all the blanks from the Talmud is written for scholars. It, it uh, assumes we know things, uh, axio axioms that we all just know, and that's not necessarily true for us, uh, but also law. Now, Rashi doesn't spend so much time with law. He's more a commentary to make, it, make the study possible. But the Ram does as well. But I wouldn't make the argument that they're the last word, but they, that's, that's their role. That's their role. Uh, a sixth reason why there's a benefit of having the oral Torah being oral, it creates a Jewish community. Right? It for forces us to study uh, with teachers and have relations and have a dynamic Jewish community. Uh, there was, it was standard in the times of the oral Torah being entirely oral where, the, where children would spend 14 years uh, under the tutelage of a scholar because otherwise they would have no idea. They wouldn't have the... Right? That creates a dynamic and growing Jewish community. And lastly, I would say not only for the students but also for the teachers. If a teacher needs to teach... It over, they have to make sure that they know the information that much better than if they hadn't uh, had that responsibility. Uh, like, like the rabbi in, uh, in Rabbi Yochanan, I think, says that I learned a lot from my teachers, I learned even more from my peers, from my colleagues, and me tell me that you're some cool, and for my students, I learned more than all of them. Because when you teach, that forces you to become that much more clear in the information. So, for I just gave you seven reasons the benefit of, of oral Torah. Does that sufficiently answer your question, Lydia? Mm -hmm. Uh, that, that, that's right. And that's why it's a big no-no to write down the oral Torah. But they were forced to write it because otherwise the Jewish, the, the Torah would not, uh, would not be, uh, would not have continuity. So it was essentially a way to transgress against the Torah but only to uphold the Torah. Um, and indeed, if you look at the, at, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the mission of the Talmud, it's such a work of unparalleled genius how they managed to write it all down but to write it down in the same manner that maintained the oral flavor. Essentially, they copy the Torah's process of taking the of writing it all there, but still maintaining the oral element, the the, the dynamic element uh, uh, necessary. Because, like I said, you want to study the Talmud; it's the encyclopedia that is not alphabetized, and it's all every entry is cut into five and scattered. That's what it is. It's all there, but they forced us to because we see the benefit of the oral of the oral study till this day. Right? We study in yeshiva because that is the only way to really understand the Torah. But the Talmud was all written down. What's the problem? Yeah, it was written down, but it was written down in a way that forced us to still maintain that same flavor of the communal study and having a teacher and having forcing yourself to try to actually understand it properly. So at yeshiva, do you spend most of your time on written Torah? Or Almost all on Talmud. On Talmud. Because Talmud gives you everything. It gives you written Torah, it gives you oral Torah, it gives you also the same, the written down version of the oral Torah, it gives you law. But even though it's very hard to, to, to glean law, that's why we study a lot of, of the Rishon, of the rabbis from the, of the medieval time. Rambam, we study tons of time in the Rambam, because the Rambam is essentially, he'll give you his conclusions of a Talmud that you just studied. And like, whoa, how did he get there, right? Because that's the next stage of the oral Torah, where he did do the halacha, the conclusions. The Talmud doesn't give you, sometimes it does, but oftentimes it does not give you conclusions. Well, so be a computer, a computer put all this stuff in order? Yeah, so now, nowadays there's so many tools that yeah. 
you know, I I know when I have a Talmud, I can't remember where it is, I Google it. Yeah. You know that? I Google Talmuds every day. Every single day I Google Talmud. Mm. Because I don't remember where everything is. I remember where a lot of stuff are, but not where everything is. Um, there, uh, There's these Wikipedia entries that would give you every time in, the, in a Talmud or it mentions a certain law. There's books written that just every word in the Talmud, every time it's placed, or every section, every subject in the Talmud, right, makes it a lot easier to study. You know, all the footnotes, footnotes just make it so easy because they'll say, oh, uh, the Talmud says this elsewhere and that there, and then brings it all together. And, but that's a product of thou- a thousand years of scholarship, from the thousand years ago till today, whereas to make the Talmud more and more and more, more accessible. Um, you said, what, there are 63 books here? 63 books, that's right. Now, the Rambam, I would tell you guys, it's a little bit late here, but I have a very, very lengthy um, excerpt from Maimonides in his introduction, not to Mishnah, but to Mishnah Torah, which is his book of Halacha, where he organizes all those scattered needles. And he gives you the whole history of from Moshe, right, till Rav Ashi, who's the 40 generations later, who was the one who wrote down uh, the, Talm- the Talmud. And every stage of the development and every decision why it was made and why halacha is so difficult to derive. And he says, well, that's where I come in and I'll tell you, uh, I'll tell you, um, I, I really should read this because it's just so fascinating. Um, go, for go for it? Okay. The subject matter of the two Talmuds is the interpretation of the text of the Mishnah and explanation of its depths and the matters that developed from the various courts at the time of Rabbi Judah the Prince until the writing of the Talmud. From the two Talmuds and from the Tosefta, which is the accompanying books, and this is from the Sephirim, the Tosefta, from all of them, together from all these haystacks, are to be found what is forbidden, what is permitted, what is unclean, what is clean, what is liable, what is exempt, what is fit for use, and what is unfit for use, which is what we, what we call halacha. According to the unbroken tradition from Moses received as received from Sinai. From them are also found the restrictive legislations enacted by the sages and prophets in each generation, which is the rabbinic edicts, to serve as a protective fence around the law, as, as, as it is learned, right? keep a preventative measures for the Torah. From them are found as well the customs and affirmative legislations that are enacted or brought into use during the various generations as the court of each generation saw fit. And it's forbidden to deviate from them, of course. And he gives all the examples of things that we, that, that we learn from that. And he gives the history. Listen to this, guys. After the court, bless you, hi. After the court of Rav Ashi, who wrote the Talmud in the time of his son and completed it, right? Rav Ashi's son completed the job, the people of Israel were scattered throughout the nations, most exceedingly, and reached the most remote parts and distant islands. And armed struggle became prevalent in the world, and the public ways became clogged with armies. The study of the Torah declined, and the people of Israel ceased to gather in places of study in their thousands and myriads as they had before. Rather, they gathered together in a few individuals, the remnant of whom the Almighty calls in each city and each town, and occupied themselves with the Torah, understood it all of the work of the sages, and knew from them what was the correct way of the laws. But what I'm telling you is like this. The Talmud has, a, has everything there. Yes, you have to study all of it, but people did study all of it. But as time progressed, it became more difficult for all the people to study all of it. You have a few people studying, studying it. Uh, um, um, uh, in our time, severe troubles come one after another, and all are in distress. The wisdom of the sages has disappeared. The understanding of our discerning men is hidden. Thus, the commentaries, the responses to the questions, the settled laws of the Gonim wrote, Right, which were all clear at one point in time, have in our times become hard to understand so that only a few properly understand them. And one hardly needs to mention the Talmud itself, the Babylonian Talmud, the Jerusalem, the Sephardim, the Sephardim, the Tosefdot, which all required a broad mind, a wise soul, and considerable time before one can correctly know from them what is forbidden or permitted and other rules of the Torah. The Ramah is telling you like this. We have all the halacha. It's all there. But you have to, you have to study all of it. And you have to be also someone very intelligent to know how to do it. And that became increasingly more difficult. For this reason, I... Moshe, the son of Rabbi Maimon, the Sephardi, found that the current situation is unbearable, and so, relying on the help of the Almighty, blessed be he, he I intently studied all these books. By the way, the Maimon tells you, you study something intently, you, you take heed. Uh, for I saw fit to write what can be determined from all these works in regards to what is forbidden and permitted and unclean and unclean and all the other rules of the Torah. Everything in clear and terse style so that the whole oral Torah will become thoroughly known to all without bringing problems 
and solutions or differences of view, but rather clear, convincing, and correct statements in accordance with the law drawn from all of these words and commentaries that, ha- that have appeared from the time of Rabbi Judah the Prince to the present. This is so that all the laws should be accessible to the small and the great in the rules of each and every commandment in the laws of the legislations of the sages and prophets. In short, listen to this, guys, listen to the sentence, so that a person should need no other work in the world in the rules of any of the laws of Israel, but this work, which will collect the entire oral Torah, including the positive mitzvahs, the customs, the negative legislations enacted from the time of Moses until the writing of the Talmud and the Gaonim, which is the inter- intermittent period. Thus I have called it Mishnah Torah, which is the complete restatement of the oral Torah, for a person reads the written Torah first and then reads this work, and they know the oral Torah without needing to read any other book. Mamani says, okay, I will simplify it to you. You want to know Talmud? You want to know it all? I'll give it to you in the form of the oral Torah. Uh, just think about what a monumental project that must have been. But essentially, that was the next frontier of the oral Torah. Became, and we see, we see patterns. It becomes too hard for people to do it in the ideal sense. Let's make it a little bit easier. First write down the Mishnah, then write down the Talmud, then write down the Halacha, and that continues to this day. So I think maybe we did it. We did an unfair job because we did it. We did it all very fast and you know very quickly. But I think if we could summarize uh, what we concluded in our discussions today, is that um, number one, how the written Torah and oral Torah are dependent upon each other. Either one without the other is impossible. A question that I think Lydia might have asked, or someone should have asked is that, well, if it's so beneficial, Rabbi, you told us seven, seven ways that oral instruction is so much better, why have the written Torah to begin with? Good question, right? Advanced question. Everyone's always, always asking me why we have the oral Torah. Well, why do we have the written Torah if the oral Torah is so fantastic? Good question. Well, the answer is that, yes, the oral Torah is fantastic, but because the written Torah is fixed and finalized and canonized and codified, your oral instruction is only as good as how well it fits into the written Torah. Remember, if you have an oral law and it's not sourced in the written Torah, we have to discard it. So it's the safeguard to prevent oral instruction gone awry, God forbid, because that could happen, right? Humans are fallible. So therefore, your oral instruction is only as good as how well it can fit into the written Torah. And by the way, I'll say further, the Mishnah, once it's finalized, everything in the Talmud has to fit into the Mishnah as well. Your oral instruction based upon the Mishnah, the form of the Talmud, is only as good as how well it fits in the Mishnah. Next step, your halacha is only as good as how well it fits in the Talmud. If I find a Talmudic teaching that teaches against your halacha, I'll discard your halacha. Each stage is making it easier and easier because it became more and more difficult. But either way, these two cannot exist without each other. The written Torah is a useless document without the oral Torah. It's written in the foreign language. You don't know what Tefillin looks like. Frontless between your eyes, what the heck does that mean? What does it mean? Eat matzah, right? What, what, uh, have a beautiful fruit, uh, shake a beautiful fruit in the holidays. What is it? What, what is a beautiful fruit? Doesn't tell, doesn't, doesn't tell what the beautiful fruit is. The book is clearly incomplete onto its own. If you read the written Torah and you fathom that God would write this, you'd have a problem because God would write this in a way like we all agreed that we should understand it and we cannot understand the written Torah. And that's all by design. Because onto its own, it is an incomplete document and tells us very, very little about actually how to live as a Jew. Unless we have the decryption code, unless we have the other side of the coin, the way to unpack it, the way to understand it, we cannot really use it for anything. We find no details, for example, as, as to how to observe the Shabbat. Shabbat, we're told eight times in the Torah, observe the Shabbat. Do what? How do we observe it? Don't do work. What's work? So the Talmud says, well, there's 39, 39 different categories of work, and it spends time talking about each one. And each one of them, it shows you how it fits into the written Torah. It's all there, it's all hidden, but it's all there. Everything is all there. It's, it's hidden in, in a very dense document that's the written Torah. Either one without the other is not good. If you have the oral Torah without the written Torah, well, what's it based upon? How do we know that, that this is not an oral tradition gone awry? Each one without the other is uh, problematic. Only together do we have Torah. To answer, what is Torah? Torah is what God wants us to know. Well, what does God want us to know? How to behave as Jews, primarily, right? Or how to think as Jews as well. 
how to talk as Jews, how to fulfill Tikkun Olam with the Torah. And God wants us to actually know this. Therefore, he gives this in this innovative way where it's a hybrid model. It's got both. It's, I'll t- teach you the same thing twice. Once in a written form, once in an oral form, both are identical. Therefore, they can be each be uh, 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 cross-checked upon, upon each other. Together we have Torah. Written Torah, all Torah together is, is, is Torah. To try to critique one without the other is impossible. You can't question someone's oral Torah because that's only a reflection of the written Torah. You can't question the written Torah without the oral Torah because it's an incomplete document. Well, it's complete, but it's all hidden there. Its meaning is, is, is not understood if you read it on its own. And the mistake that the Bible critics have made is that they, uh, they're assuming that Moshe is the author, or at least traditional perspective is that Moshe is the author. Thus, if Moshe is the author, then he's writing a book like any other human who write a book. We say that Moshe is not the author. Moshe has zero editorial control over the Torah. God's the author. And then wait, how would God write a book? You write in a perfect way. The only way to write it perfectly, that it still is today the same way we got it at Sinai, is if you have the oral component as well. And thus, if you want to challenge the traditional Jewish perspective of the legitimacy of the Torah, you have to challenge the entire book, which is the written oral Torah compo- components, components together. And by the way, almost every question that the Bible critics have asked, you know who else asked? The oral Torah asks. Because it's not like, oh, they, we got by the editors. Of course they didn't get by the editors. It's, it's all asked. It's all, and, the, and we have the answers. But if you're working with the model that this is a book like any other book, of course you'll ask questions. But once again, you're reading it in a foreign language. You have no idea what language it's written in. Either way, I think this should provide some clarity as to what we mean. It's not what we mean the rabbis are inventing and trying to make our lives miserable. That's not what we mean when we say oral Torah. Oral Torah, according to Jewish tradition, goes all the way back to Moses. It is as legitimate as the written Torah itself. No difference. In fact, Moshe gave us more of that, spent more time with oral Torah than the written Torah. The written Torah is, is fixed, you know, and of course the oral Torah asked the question, well, how do we know that it, it was, means that was given to us, that's our job, and there were, you know, important visionary decisions made to write down certain sections of it. But what is Torah? Torah is both. What did Moshe give us? Moshe gave us both. What does the Almighty want us to have? Both. That's the only way it could, it could be, and that's the only way that, indeed, it has withstood the test of time. We have the same Torah today that Moshe got from Mount Sinai. Incredibly. Why? Because that's the way Almighty engineered it, because that's the only way that it could possibly be done in this dual format. So I think, um, hopefully, this should dispel a lot of misconceptions that Jews have about this subject. Indeed, it's not an easy chapter. We went through it very quickly. It, pro- we probably could spend five hours talking about it. Uh, just all the details, many more examples, and kind of go through each step uh, onto its own. But I think there is also a benefit of looking at it as, you know, collectively in, 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 one, in one sitting, in one session, and seeing it just, you know, one picture. What is Torah? What are we making? What, what, what claim are we doing? You know, are we just, is it just the rabbis trying to pull the wool over our eyes and make our lives miserable? Clearly not. Right? Why? Because there has to be uh, there has to be this model because that's the only way that God would do it and indeed that's the only way it can be done to have it uh, uh, withstand all uh, of um, the difficulties of, human, of Jewish history uh, to survive till this day. That's that, guys. Any questions? <laughs> You're like, oh, guys. A lot of questions. But, uh, okay, so you know, let, let, let's, let's keep this dialogue uh, open. Don't, don't hesitate to ask the questions, guys. Well, Go ahead, John. Started a class. Yes. I mentioned and it was agreed to that we would take one portion of the Torah during our classes and analyze it and try to break it down from gibberish, as it were, yes. to the secret code. Yes. If you remember, we did that a few times. And we did. Yes, we did it with the with the with the story of um, with the story of the golden calf, and we talked about that with the verses and kind of. Ask all the questions. Well, what's Didn't going on? We do that today. Well, the, we should with, do it again. I agree with, with the cock thing. And uh, uh, didn't we do that? Oh today? yeah, yeah, cock. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we did. We did an example of that. Oh, we, we, you know what, guys? We have a, a winter. We have a winter um, curriculum that hasn't been finalized. Send in requests, guys. This is it. We have 15 classes in the winter that uh, we don't have uh, subject matter necessarily finalized. Send in, send in what you want to talk about. Yeah, Let's do it. Me or Rabbi he don't want to find. 
That's that, guys. Very interesting. Uh, very fascinating. I would encourage everyone, if they can, get their chance. Maybe I'll, you know, I'll have Dan email this out. Just, it's, it's written, it's, it's not very long. And it's just very, uh, very concise. Maimonides' introduction to Mishnah Torah, to his book. He goes through all the history from the beginning to the end. It means he starts from Moses to Rav Ashi, Rav Ashi back to Moses, so you, and then you, you his role. the introduction to his book, you mean the Mishnah Torah? The Mishnah Torah, that's not, right. Not the guide to, per, to the per, no, per no, place. No, no, right? no. So, so that's an email sent out with uh, Yes. Very interesting. Either way, guys, see you guys next week. Have a happy Hanukkah. Thank you. Happy you Hanukkah. Too. Tonight. And tonight, that's right. 5 p.m. Uh, Hanukkah, Hanukkah in the park. Oh, yes. Town center.